Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School teaches product management, product leadership, data analytics, digital marketing, UX design, and data analytics courses online and at our 16 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Today, we have an awesome guest presenting. I'd like to introduce you to Soheb Thiab. Soheb is a seasoned product management executive with more than eight years working as a PM in different companies. Currently, Soheb is working at Booking.com, the world's largest online travel company. Previous to that, Soheb was heading the product team at 7AWI, one of the largest tech and digital publishers in the Middle East region. Soheb is a Scrum and Agile expert and a certified Scrum trainer. He is also an internet entrepreneur that established and sold websites to Yahoo and D1G. He was also selected as an Endeavor entrepreneur in 2011 for his initiative in co-founding co the gaming company Wizards Productions. Feel free to leave any questions for Soheb in the comments of Facebook, and I'll be sure to ask them at the end of the presentation. And without further ado, let's welcome Soheb. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, hi. Uh, pleasure to be joining you guys. Yes. Um, so let me see. Uh, let me share my screen here real quick. Um, can you guys see it? Yep, looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, today I'll be talking to you guys about uh, data-driven product management. I'm very excited to be here today talking to the product school uh, community. Um, it's a, it's, I, I would like to think uh, of myself as part of that community as well. I've been following uh, lots of the presentations here and I'm very excited to be part, uh, to be presenting to, to you guys today about this, uh, this very exciting topic. So I think uh, to get it started, I think data-driven product management is a, a topic that is relevant for uh, um, uh, PMs. It's relevant, of course, for if you're either starting your career as a PM today, or you're currently a PM, or you work with PMs at your current company. And I also think uh, it's a relevant topic uh, for uh, um, any size of a company, whether it's a your own startup, uh, or you're working for a startup, or you're working at a big organization. Um, so um, today I'll be taking you through uh, a few points uh, in the coming uh, next 30 minutes. Um, first off, I'll be talking about why uh, is data-driven data product management important, and why is it important for a, any product manager that wants to have a, a, a successful career, uh, how to become uh, uh, data-driven, what's the state of mind that product managers should have uh, uh, to be data-driven, and uh, I'll quickly go through some uh, tactics or methods that you can apply. Uh, and test uh, to uh, uh, become a data-driven product manager, hopefully. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, let me give you guys a quick introduction about myself. Um, so um, I, I'm currently working as a product manager in uh, Booking.com, which is uh, the largest uh, uh, travel tech company uh, in the world, uh, and uh, their headquarters in, in Amsterdam. Uh, I've joined them two years ago. Previously to joining Booking, I co-founded a number of uh, uh, startups. Some failed and some succeeded. And uh, I learned a lot about uh, using data um, in the products that I've built uh, along these uh, along these years. Um, so I started a, 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 a the first Arabic social networking uh, website, which was acquired by uh, Maktoub, which was later on, on acquired by Yahoo. Uh, also uh, after that. Um, co-founded a gaming company, uh, went through um, um, uh, starting a, a startup from scratch, and I'm also uh, currently working at a big organization with hundreds of, uh, of uh, product teams and uh, a company that uh, runs hundreds of experiments uh, per day. Um, and uh, to get uh, to be, so before we, uh, I get into um, uh, the why, uh, and why is data-driven product management important? Um, I would like you to uh, think for a couple of seconds of um, why uh, or what is the uh, a prime job of a product manager? Why does a uh, company hire a product manager? What do they expect a product manager to deliver? Um, and just think for all that for a couple of seconds. And 
to be honest, like I, 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 when I started my career, I really didn't think of it in that way. Uh, but if you think about it, I think the biggest uh, uh, or the prime focus of a product manager is to make sure that they are they are ROI positive. Uh, um, this can apply for your uh, product that you're managing or the section of a product you're managing, or even if uh, you're working at your own startup or you're part of a small startup, you need to make sure that uh, ultimately um, that product or startup or initiative is ROI positive. And I think uh, that's where uh, product management is, um, uh, is an area where you need to um, balance between multiple uh, multiple uh, sides or multiple factors to make sure that you are at the, at the end of the day ROI positive. And I think uh, that is where data becomes ex uh, extremely important um, because it helps you uh, uh, make sure or increase the chances that you are ROI positive at the end, at the end of the day. Um, so um, why is it important? And I think um, for a number of reasons, obviously, and I think the mo one of the biggest or most important reasons is that data removes um, uh, opinion-based decisions. Uh, this is uh, from my personal experience and I've seen also from colleagues and friends that have worked or started companies. I think uh, opinion-based decisions is one of the biggest uh, uh, pitfalls that companies and startups uh, or even sometimes, in many cases, even bigger companies fall into. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, opinions are e very easy to form and to come up, to come by. Um, and uh, going down, following, uh, like developing a product or a feature solely based on an opinion, usually uh, ends up with a, um, uh, with a failed outcome or a failed experiment or a failed feature. Um, and uh, in all cases, regardless of whether it's a small company or a big company, that's wasted resources that might have been put into a more important uh, thing that develops, uh, that returns value for the company. Um, being data-driven also eliminates bias. Um, it eliminates, in some cases, hidden agendas, um, and it helps PMs focus on the customer. Uh, it helps PMs bring the voice of the customer to the table uh, through the data that customers generate while they're using uh, the product that you're managing. Um, so it's very easy to um, yeah, remove the bias that uh, usually are part of any discussion. Um, and by focusing on the data, um, that helps PMs and people that work with the PMs and the company to focus on uh, what's really important, which is the customer. Um, and of course, that helps PMs moving forward and deciding what do they build and what do they focus on. And uh, so, yeah, so I think the biggest contribution of, uh, of uh, data is that uh, a big part of what products or product managers do on a daily basis is to um, prioritize a, a usually a big, a big backlog of ex stories or features or ideas that uh, they get or the people around them get. Um, and uh, basing these ideas or these uh, stories in your backlog on data um, in the form of either a hypothesis, which we'll cover later on uh, in a bit more detail, but it helps you um, determine what uh, is a must have, what is a nice to have, and uh, you'll be able to justify why is that so? Why is, the, is a specific feature a must have versus something that is nice to have? And it also, I think, um, uh, allows the or gives the uh, product managers the ability to say no, which is something that many uh, product managers uh, find hard to do, especially at the beginning of their career and even at later stages. It's usually uh, easier to uh, try to accommodate all of the ideas that come along. Uh, or to are suggested to you. Uh, and it's much, much harder to say no to an idea, uh, especially if it comes uh, from your team or uh, from somebody influential in, in, in your organization. Um, so basing ideas and, and prioritizing features on data uh, based on their outcome and their um, ROI um, uh, makes, I think, the job of prioritizing your, your backlog and prioritizing what you want to build uh, that much easier. And 
and I also think like the, uh, the next benefit of being data driven is uh, it, it helps you avoid another pitfall of um, uh, many product uh, many products that end up uh, trying to solve a customer problem uh, by uh, building new features. And uh, I think basing decisions uh, of what you build on, on data helps you avoid uh, feature overloads that uh, I'm building features that nobody really um, needs. Um, in many cases, um, developing a feature, uh, uh, like, you know, so trying to fix a problem of customer retention or uh, loyalty or um, um, uh, monetization. Uh, in many cases, uh, it's more about listening to customers and finding what customers really uh, need uh, rather than uh, building out new features based on opinions or based on uh, what we think the customer needs. Um, and uh, data also, I think, helps um, product managers um, balance between all of the different stakeholders. So if you think about it, a product manager's job is, is quite complicated. Product managers sit in between uh, multiple teams and multiple stakeholders. Um, and they need to manage the expectations of these stakeholders and, the, uh, and prioritize all of the features that might be uh, required by these different stakeholders. So you have tech teams, you have the leadership team, uh, you have uh, other product managers and other teams that might be working on something that uh, you own or related to your uh, area. And also sales teams and marketing teams that also uh, ask for uh, new features to, to be built. And product managers sit between all of those different stakeholders and between what they actually believe is the priority for their own product that achieve, that helps them achieve their uh, what they're after or what their, uh, their targets. And um, having data to back up all of these discussions makes, them, uh, makes it a much easier uh, task. Um, uh, because again, uh, uh, basing, decisions on uh, on what gets built on data may uh, helps you prioritize all of these different and in many cases competing um, requirements or competing features and i think uh, the last point on why data driven uh, 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 product management is important is that it helps deal with one of the trickiest situations um, that I, I have come across in the in the past and i i, I believe many product managers face uh, which is uh, dealing with hippos, um, and hippos. If you don't know what what it stands for, it's basically the uh, highest paid person's opinion. Uh, it's usually um, uh, and the opinion of the CEO or the head of product or uh, head of the sales team or whoever uh, is usually uh, 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 yeah the highest paid, uh, paid person, um, and uh, they usually. Uh, have their way, uh, regardless of what the data says, if data exists uh, in that case, and they manage to uh, prioritize whatever they think um, should be built next. Uh, it might be based on their own opinion or based on what they've seen at a competitor or uh, what their friend or wife or husband thinks that uh, you should be dropping everything that your, your team currently works on and you should be uh, developing next. Um, uh, and the way this, uh, the way data helps, I think, dealing with, uh, with such a tricky situation is that uh, it really um, uh, depersonalizes the, the situation. So when it's all when it's all about data and it's no longer uh, my opinion versus somebody else's opinion, uh, it's easier to uh, explain to that person, to the hippo in this case, uh, that um, their idea might not be the best idea. It also helps refocus the uh, the discussion about the customer, um, and um, yeah, it just I think really helps um, uh, deal with the entire situation. Because in many cases, uh, it it very quickly becomes a a, a power play or a person or or, or, a, or a personal situation, and um, um, making decisions based on data uh, and the outcomes that we expect out of that uh, 
out of that uh, uh, improvement of feature uh, really, um, uh, I think, makes it very hard for anybody to compete against or argue against the customer's voice in this case. Um, so if everything is really formed in, a, in the company or in the organization uh, as part of a, an experiment or a hypothesis, which uh, I'll also cover slightly in the next slides, um, uh, it makes these types of discussions uh, way, way easier. And I think this is no longer the um, uh, something that we need or the future of decision making. I think in many cases, uh, companies or bigger companies um, are already adopting this type of product development. So, uh, for example, in, 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 uh, in Booking.com, where I currently work, um, all decisions are based on experiments. And uh, all of the, all of the experiments are formed through a, a, hypo a hypothesis that is always backed up by data. And the bigger the volume of the data that is being used, uh, the bigger the sample size uh, or the analysis that or the data that the analysis is based on, uh, the more the chances that uh, uh, the experiment or the uh, idea. Uh, has a like has a more uh, chance to be a successful one. So I think um, uh, that is more about the. Uh, so I think that sort of covers why uh, data driven is important, and uh, why um, you should focus on either uh, ha like adult first thinking in this way, and then why. Uh, you should encourage your organization or your company if you're not part of a company that already thinks in this way to uh, to be to, to to adopt such a such a way um, so uh, next talk uh, uh, the next topic is or the next point is how how to become a data driven pm um, and i think uh, first of all it really requires uh, a mindset that embraces fear um, you you and your team and your organization needs to be uh, embracing failure and thinking that failures uh, or they need we the, you need to look at failures as an opportunity to learn um, and every failure comes with a with a with something new um, so you've either you um, uh, validate uh, an idea which if it works out or uh, it doesn't work out and you know that that's not the uh, um, the right way of, of uh, growing your product or, or fixing the, the, uh, the customer's uh, pain point. Uh, this is not something that is easy to accomplish. If, uh, again, if you're working at a company that has this culture and this mindset, um, that is really good. That will help you a lot in, 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 in accomplishing it. But if you don't, it's, I think it's always uh, uh, easy to start with yourself and with your team. Uh, build a, uh, a successful case uh, there, and then uh, try to uh, um, to uh, 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 to convince others to adopt a similar uh, approach. Uh, so, for example, uh, of a company that has such a mentality, uh, uh, where currently I work, which is uh, uh, in booking, there is a um, uh, we basically have a, a yearly budget for uh, for failed experiments. Um, and this is a, a, a an actually like a monetary budget where um, we know that uh, if an experiment fails, it usually it might mean a, a customers that we've lost or uh, convergence that we've lost, uh, or in some cases it might have led to uh, an increase in customer tickets, for example, which is another monetary cost for us. Um, but that's that's how far some companies take um, uh, this this mindset. Uh, to encourage their teams to experiment and try and fail. Um, so um, the culture looks like more, more that it's, it's, it's hypothesis driven. It, must, it has to be uh, any hypothesis or idea must be backed up by data. Um, uh, and you, you have to define a success metric beforehand, before you start your experiment. And it's never based on an opinion. It can be initiated based on an opinion, but then you're, you need to validate your opinion or your gut feeling uh, with data. So we will we'll dive a bit uh, deeper into, into uh, this. Um, so 
first question is, well, like, where does data come from? Um, uh, and I think this is this is true to any size of the company. So whether it's a startup or a uh, or, or a large organization, I think you'll you'll always have some sort of um, uh, way to start uh, to start exploring this data. So. Uh, it can come from qualitative uh, data sources or quantitative data sources. Uh, so qualitative is, uh, for example, uh, a really easy one is a conference. You might gain an insight from a conference that you attend um, where, you've see, where you can see uh, an insight from a competitor or an industry trend. Uh, it can come from also from customer surveys, which are relatively cheap to, uh, uh, to implement and get. Uh, it can come from your sales team. It can come from a, a customer forum where customers are currently uh, discussing something, and that, that that gives you an idea or a hypothesis. Uh, and then, uh, usually, that qualitative data insight um, gives you the signal to explore further and spend uh, slightly more effort into digging deeper, which is usually going into quantitative quantitative data sources. So these usually come from your own database. Uh, it can be, it can come from simply some tools such as Google Analytics or other analytics tools that, that you might, might have implemented. It can come also from, if you uh, have experiments or have an A-B testing tool, it can come from historical or previous experiments uh, to try and validate that signal or that uh, 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 hypothesis or that idea that you've uh, picked up from uh, a qualitative data source. Um, and then you sort of, if you find a signal or if you find a validation for that idea in one or two or both of these uh, uh, data sources, then you start basically forming your hypothesis um, and your experiment. So this brings me back to the, uh, the uh, sorry, uh, to the topic of um, uh, hypothesis testing. So what is exactly uh, hypothesis testing? So um, in, sim in simple terms, it's basically an A-B test uh, that is driven by data, um, uh, which is formulated with the formulation of an expected outcome uh, based on this data. So you basically um, uh, uh, think of uh, a feature or, an, or, or a, a test where um, in the B version of that test, you you want to implement a feature or an improvement, um, and uh, you base that on the data that you've already uh, gathered, and uh, you track that as you start that experiment, and you monitor does that does this uh, does this implementation of uh, or is this implementation of of, of uh, the specific feature moving your uh, metrics or moving your uh, 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 KPIs. So what makes a good hypothesis? Uh, usually a good hypothesis is something that you believe that you believe is true, but you don't know for sure yet. Um, again, this can come from your own observations, your gut feeling, research, internal, external data. It can come from any of these, these sources or a bunch of them. Uh, and you have a good feeling that this is something that is, uh, you believe or your team believes that it's true. Um, it's a prediction that you expect to arrive. It can be easily tested and it, it can be true and it can be false. So that's why many of experiments actually fail. Um, it, can, it, it needs to include a target group. So um, usually you don't experiment with uh, your entire user set um, and it needs to be clear and measurable. Um, and measuring, uh, uh, measuring your your experiment and measuring the success of the experiment is super critical, um, and it's uh, and it's also extremely critical to set up your success criteria before you actually start the experiment. Uh, so before you do that, you need to specify exactly which metrics you want to track, uh, and in this case, you actually need to make sure that you have metrics to uh, that you can correctly track. And you should never develop an idea, let alone start, uh, start working on it uh, without establishing these success metrics and success criteria. Because if you don't, uh, and you're, you're really not like thinking of that, and that's just, just, just an afterthought, uh, you might end up spending a lot of precious 
um, resources, building something that you can't really measure. You can't really tell after you've finished building it, whether this was worth it, was it successful or not. Um, so for example, uh, ask yourself, does my success criteria uh, for this idea lend itself to calculation? Is it a number? Compare easily across different experiments and over time. Does it give me results that help me make a decision moving forward? Uh, does it give me enough details to execute? And does it reflect our uh, 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 strategic goals? So whether that's acquisition of new customers, retaining, engaging users, or growing uh, your product. And uh, as I mentioned, like setting up your success, success criteria ahead of time is super critical. It sounds um, uh, easy and it sounds basic, but uh, it's so it's very it's very easy to uh, basically if you don't set up, set up your success criteria over time uh, ahead of time, uh, it's easy to start um, interpreting the experiment the way the results are actually uh, coming in. So if you um, uh, if you don't set that up uh, beforehand, um, it's usually uh, what it ends up usually happening is that uh, you or your team uh, start trying to interpret the data uh, that you're seeing in the experiment uh, to justify uh, accepting it. Um, so, um, uh, so, for example, you need to ask yourself: Does my success criteria for this idea? Um, uh, does it give me the uh, result that helped me make a decision? Um, and uh, in all of these things, you need to really uh, beware of vanity metrics. So vanity metrics are very risky. Uh, um, and uh, vanity metrics are simply things like page views, uh, unique users, Facebook likes. Uh, they're really metrics that uh, don't um, give you detailed view of what's happening in your product. They're usually high level trends in your business and they really uh, give you very little uh, on uh, very little insights on how you can improve improve your uh, uh, your product so a simple way of how you can start um, experimenting with this or start implementing it, uh, it is to um, ask ask a question uh, again the question can be um, can come from uh, previous data uh, customer complaint uh, customers asking for a specific thing, uh, which ignites or which starts this process. Um, and then once you have that question, once you start asking that question, um, you start re researching data to gain a signal or find a validation that uh, uh, this is a good idea, basically. And then you form a hypothesis. Uh, and when you form that hypothesis, uh, you define your metrics, you uh, set up the success criteria, uh, before you start that experiment, um, and uh, you either, and then you basically start that, you start the A-B test. And uh, you should always define, uh, think of the runtime of that experiment. Um, think of uh, how much traffic this area of the product gets, and how many users do you need to, uh, uh, to see the change, to be able to have a, a basically a conclusive ex a result. Most A/B testing tools have this built in, so uh, but there are there are and they provide these uh, like tools that you can use to make this calculation. So it's nothing super uh, complicated, but it's super it's very important to to do that before uh, starting the experiment. And you basically let the experiment uh, run out um, its runtime, and then you look at the uh, results and the conclusions, um, uh, and you you draw conclusions based based on the results. And you either, based on these results, you either accept that hypothesis or you reject it. And in many cases, I would say 80% or more of these cases, uh, hypothesis fail, experiments fail, which is uh, very normal. Uh, and But it's again, that's why a culture that expects uh, uh, that accepts failure or accepts Failed experiments is very important because because that's that's usually how it goes. 
uh, most experiments fail. Uh, and then yeah, you try again, but then uh, you know that it's either uh, the feature itself uh, wasn't implemented correctly or it was based on the wrong data or it's something that you can scratch completely off your backlog, your backlog and you can focus on uh, something else. Um, so to, to recap, um, just aware of the time, we don't have much left. So, uh, so takeaways, key takeaways uh, in these 30 minutes is uh, mindset, mindset is the first step. Um, uh, without the mindset, uh, starting with yourself and with the people around you, it's extremely hard to, uh, to make it work. So uh, mindset is, is the first step. Uh, you need to optimize for the right metric. You need to think of uh, which metric is the right metric for this experiment. Uh, or this feature, um, and then you need to test fast, fail fast, and adjust fast. Um, uh, you can't basically uh, uh, count on or spend a lot of time validating this hypothesis. Uh, and it's usually a good idea to build an MVP, um, simplify the idea as, as much as possible, uh, base it on data, and uh, run an experiment validate that idea as, full, as fast as possible, and then iterate on it or uh, scratch it off uh, and, uh, and move on to the next, to the next uh, idea. And basically always optimize for customer experience, uh, not the effort, effort or, or the revenue. And that's, I think, basically um, uh, the, the end of, of uh, this presentation. I'm very happy to... Uh, take any questions or uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any uh, um, uh, yeah, follow-up questions or, uh, or things that you would like to, uh, to discuss. Awesome, thank you so much, Soheb. We do have uh, quite a few questions here for you if you have some extra time. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. So uh, Jen asked, what data collection tools do you use to get the most value? Um, so usually, um, uh, in my, in my in the current company that I work in, we usually have a bunch of internal tools that we've developed, and we also use a bunch of external tools. So, um, so for example, Hotjar or uh, uh, SurveyMonkey. Uh, these are some third-party tools that you can use to uh, gather insights. Uh, so, SurveyMonkey you can, allows you to reach out to your customers with a survey. Uh, try to validate whatever idea that you currently have with this set of customers usually is a good idea. Um, and then take it further if you get that validation. Uh, and there's like Hotjar, you can use that to also pop up uh, surveys or polls within the product uh, as, the, as the users are using the product. And then there's a bunch of internal tools. So, but uh, it's very easy to um, find such tools uh, on Google. Awesome, okay. Um... Yichin said, what kind of degree is required for becoming a product manager? Computer science, statistics, operation research, and MBA? So I've, I've seen a mix of all of these uh, in, the, in, the, in my experience. So I personally come from a computer science background. Uh, uh, I've seen product managers that come from a data science background, others that come from a user experience background. I think each one of these backgrounds brings in value for the product manager uh, and uh, it complements uh, uh, the experience of the product manager. I think for this topic being data-driven, I think it adds a lot of value if at least you can rely on yourself uh, to uh, get some data. In most cases, uh, small or big companies, um, it's uh, uh, like digging deeper and trying to find data uh, 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 is, is not that easy and it requires backend or development resources. So if you can rely on yourself at, at least to find these early signals, uh, it's usually a very good idea. But I've seen, I've seen uh, product managers come from different backgrounds and MBA is usually not required. There's a small number of companies that require an MBA to become a product manager, uh, but I've seen uh, many product managers without an MBA. Cool. So Chris asked, how do you use data to balance resources between addressing technical debt versus new features? That's a very good question, actually. Um, that's a, it's something that I think 
uh, uh, in big products. It's usually something that product managers struggle with for sure, uh, because usually technical depth uh, gets deprioritized from a, a product or a business impact perspective. Uh, but I think when it, uh, and it's usually uh, uh, fine. I think if you base things on data, uh, uh, technical depth usually gets a lower priority usually, which is I think fine as long as that is not impacting the performance of the product. So if it comes to a point where the technical depth is costing us money, or you can prove that the technical depth is slowing us down uh, or causing downtimes or slowing uh, development, I think that's also data that you can reference to uh, make a case for uh, improving the technical depth situation. Uh, so I think in both cases, data can play a role in supporting uh, either either cases. But I think technical depth needs to to be at a, at a stage where it impacts uh, the product uh, in a big way to to to, uh, to to get to get a priority. That's I think just how how realistic it is. Usually, it doesn't get a priority unless it starts affecting the product. Okay, awesome. So um, Jen asked again, what metrics do you find generate the most ROI? Uh, so that's, a, uh, to be honest, that's a broad question. It really depends on the product itself, the, uh, the, uh, the industry that the product um, uh, works with. So the, 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 um, uh, the sort of the broad metrics that covers most products are uh, uh, things like daily active users, conversion, uh, um, a customer lifetime value, uh, uh, net promoter score. Uh, these are the sort of, I think, the broad metrics that cover most products, but it, it really differs big uh, in a big way between um, uh, products and, and the industries and the, the products operating. Awesome. So, um, Christos said, is your team usually diverse in terms of roles, scientists, designers, engineers, et cetera? How can you achieve an effective communication with such diversity? Um, so yeah, so so currently uh, I, I work with a diverse team of uh, backend developers, frontend developers, designers, and data scientists. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, this is this is the, the direct team that I work with. And then there's of course the broader team that uh, my team operates in. Uh, and I think like the diversity is. Uh, it brings in it, it adds a lot of value into the discussion uh, discussions that we usually have and I think but having a, a, a joint agreement that decisions will be based on data helps a lot to move things forward instead of spending time and effort debating opinions uh, we focus on uh, prioritizing uh, what um, we can back up with data and uh, if we if somebody really thinks that they their idea, uh, has value, they need to prove it with data. So they need to spend the effort to, to try and validate it or convince others to spend that effort to, to try and validate it. Uh, so I think it, uh, it, it, uh, the diversity is fine as long as you have this joint agreement uh, that decisions will be based on data. Great. So our last question here is from Chi. How can you define if a metric is good enough? Um, so uh, so that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think, f first of all, you need to think of the exact feature that you're developing is a, and what metric does it affect. Uh, and there are immediate metrics that features affect. So, for example, if you're changing a um, landing page and you're changing the entire landing page for with, uh, with, the, with the hope that you're increase increased conversion. So one metric could be uh, the increase in conversion. But maybe ultimately uh, that increase in conversion should increase an in increase in, re in revenue. Um, so what, what do you track exactly in the experiment? Do you track the end goal or do you track the shorter goal? Uh, so usually if you uh, experiments have a short runtime um, and, uh, and I, I would I, I usually go with the immediate impact of the experiment. Uh, so if you're improving a landing page, we should, exp uh, we should expect a, an increase in conversion, for example, or increase in signups. Um, and then you try and validate whether that increase in signups increase something else later on down the road. And then there's the technical aspects of uh, our metrics currently 
uh, tracked correctly? Or they, do we trust our data sources? Um, uh, that is super critical to be aware of and to, be, uh, to make sure that you're actually tracking, uh, storing the right data and tracking the right, uh, and uh, basically reading it correctly from the correct uh, source. Because again, like in, in big organizations, usually uh, there is lots of data sources and lots of tables to where data can be stored. And uh, you need to just make sure that you're, uh, uh, you have the right metric. Awesome, really interesting. Thank you so much for answering these questions. Thanks for our community to asking them to Sohev here. Sure. And uh, yeah, I think that wraps it up. So uh, before we leave, I wanted to give everyone some more information on Product School and our upcoming courses and events. Um, product School teaches product management, product leadership, coding, data analytics, UX design, and digital marketing courses. And they're taught by uh, industry experts working at companies like Google and Facebook. And in addition to that, we offer weekly online and on-site events at our 16 campuses across the US, UK, and Canada. We're now in Washington, DC. So if you're in Washington, DC, make sure you stop by. And uh, yeah, if you're located near a campus, make sure you stop by one of our weekly events every Wednesday and Thursday. You can also find us on social media at Product School and be sure to um, check out the product blog at productschool.com to keep up with the latest product management content. Thank you all for enjoying. Thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, I hope to see you next week. Thank you a bunch. So hey, great presentation. Bye bye. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.